Okay. Okay. So next speaker yeah. is Iris Freitas, remotely from Pittsburgh, who will talk about uh, electric precision tests and, and uh, th th theory uncertainties. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I envy you that you sit in such a nice room, but um, I will have to make do with the Pittsburgh weather. Uh, so uh, I can skip the outline because uh, Sven has already said a couple of times what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I hope I actually be able to cover all of that. So let's move straight to the next slide. So let me recap um, quickly the main electric position observables. There's the W mass, which you all know is extracted from uh, the Fermi constant. But I think it's important to uh, remember that the Fermi constant itself is extracted from muon decay. And there are QED corrections that go into that extraction. Fortunately, these QED corrections are known at the TULIP level, and the uncertainty at currently is, is pretty small, actually below the experimental uncertainty. And then um, from the Fermi constant, we can extract the W mass. And this relation includes electroweak corrections, which are typically summarized in a quantity called delta R, uh, that you see some examples for diagrams on the right-hand side. Going to the next slide, um, the uh, other most important electric position observables are obtained um, from a plus and minus scattering on the z-pole. And there's a resonance piece which comes from the z-resonance, which can be parametrized in terms of the z-partial width. And there's a non-resonant piece, which comes from photon exchange. Going to the next slide, um, <clears throat> again, for this observable, one can separate QED and also QCD corrections of the external fermions, which are contained in radiator functions. And there has been a lot of effort to calculate these for the QCD case. Inclusively, they are known up to for loop level. Going to the next slide. Um, separately, also for the initial state, there are QED corrections where a lot of effort has gone into computing those. This is actually not just a factor, but a convolution that needs to be performed because of the effect on the hard uh, center of mass energy. And then going to the next slide, uh, in blue, I have marked the electroweak corrections, which are sensitive to the properties of the standard model or properties of physics beyond the standard model. And besides the cross-section and the partial width, there are, of course, also the asymmetry factors, which depend on the ratio of these electroweak factors for vector and axial vector couplings. And those are obtained from the forward-backward or from the left-right asymmetry. So, move on to the next slide. These electroweak factors, uh, both for the W mass as well as for the Z-pole observables, they also have um, received a lot of work from many different groups. So, delta R and the effective weak mixing angle, which parameterizes the ratio of GV and GA, they are known now at a complete two-loop level <clears throat> due to the work of many groups. For the form factors GV and GA itself, which are relevant, for instance, if we want to compute the total cross-section or the different decay width, uh, they are known almost at a complete two-loop level, but uh, only for diagrams that include at least one closed fermion loop, which are, you know, among the... the um, but so to say, we use the jargon for that fermionic next to next to leading order corrections. And there are even some higher order corrections that are known, partial pre and for loop corrections. Um, in particular, those that are enhanced by powers of the top work mass or the top Yukawa coupling. Uh, and these, uh, together with some uh, QCD corrections, uh, the leading three and four loop corrections are also known and sometimes numerically relevant. So let's move to the next slide. So if we look at the uncertainties of a number of different observables, I've picked a few typical examples here. The W mass, the Z boson total width, the Z boson hadronic cross-section on the peak. That means Z decaying to hadrons. 
on the peak. And the ratio of the branching ratio of the Z boson into BD bar and the leptonic effective weak mixing angle. And so the experimental uncertainties for all these different quantities are by and large at the per mil level, uh, which is a very high level of precision. But fortunately, due to the efforts of so many people for computing electroweak and QED and QCD corrections, the theory uncertainty for all these uh, quantities within the standard model is sufficiently below that experimental uncertainty. And the main source of uncertainty uh, that still remains here comes from free loop corrections, um, in particular those that involve some mixing of electroweak and QCD loops. So how do we obtain these uh, theory error estimates? Sven has already mentioned it shortly. There are different methods, and none of them these are a golden bullet, which is absolutely reliable. One thing one can do is look at parametric factors that come from a certain class of diagrams. So we can count powers of alpha or alpha s or number of colors or number of fermions that appear in a loop. Another possibility is if we have computed already uh, a number of orders of some observable, we can look at um, how they progress order by order and try to extrapolate from that, for instance, assuming that they behave like a geometric series. A third possibility is to look at renormalization scale dependence. This is, of course, uh, used a lot for QCD corrections at Hadron colliders and works fairly well there. Unfortunately, for electroweak corrections, one could use them too if one works in the MS bar scheme, but experience shows that this tends to often underestimate the uncertainty. And finally, one can also simply compare different renormalization schemes. Uh, that is to be definitely um, a reasonable thing to do and gives us probably something like a lower bound on the uncertainty. But again, we don't really know that whether the difference between different renormalization schemes will cover uh, the whole range of possibilities what happens at a higher order. So let's move to the next slide. Here's just um, a short example for one of the quantities, the, the total Z width, how this um, uncertainty estimate works out. Because we already know the uh, top you cover enhanced corrections at three loop, they are being subtracted from the estimate of the three and also four loop uh, missing contributions. So we only want to estimate the effect of the remaining stuff. And so on the upper half of the slide, I show the estimate obtained from the geometric series assumption for different contributions. And um, in the lower part uh, of the slide for comparison, I saw what, show what one gets for two examples if one just counts typical um, parametric factors like alpha squared or in the second case, alpha S squared times alpha times the number of light fermions that run in the loop. And in this case, fortunately, one sees that either of the two methods lead to roughly consistent estimates. And if one combines them in quadrature, the total uncertainty is about half uh, MeV. So moving to the next slide, what I just said, adding theory errors in quadrature is also in principle debatable. We really don't know how different orders uh, that are unknown relate to each other. And in principle, one can follow two philosophies. One is that one adds all the theory errors from different uh, orders linearly, which of course leads to a larger estimate. If one does that, however, and this result is being used in one of the global fits, like something like uh, uh, G-fitter or the LHC electric uh, group, uh, then one should use um, a distribution for this uncertainty, which is flat and has sharp cutoffs. On the other hand, one could assume that the theory errors are completely uncorrelated, so they behave like a statistical ensemble, and um, in this case, one may argue that one would want to add them quadratically, and uh, using the central limit theorem, one would then 
they they are distributed according to a Gaussian distribution, and this is to be used in the global fits. So moving on to the next slide. Now thinking about the future, future E plus E minus colliders like ILC, TLAB, FCC, EE, however you want to call them, have the potential to dramatically increase the precision of these observables um, by a factor of a few or even um, more than an order of magnitude. Uh, if one compares them with our current uncertainty from unknown higher orders in the loops, and we can clearly see that our theory prediction wouldn't be adequate for this situation. So more work will need to be done. If we move to the next slide, I've tried to estimate what one would gain if we compute uh, the most important three loop corrections. Most important here means, again, diagrams that involve some number of uh, closed fermion loops, because experience from lower orders shows that these are dominant. And um, I also think, you know, that with some pretty heroic but not crazy amount of effort, this uh, may be feasible over some number of years. And so you can see here in, in the middle column, basically, that one gets to a precision which is um, comparable to ILC and uh, TLAB, um, but, you know, not necessarily much below that, in some cases even a little bit worse, like in the uh, effective weak mixing angle. In addition, we also have to keep in mind that besides perturbative uncertainties, there are uncertainties from the input parameters that go into a prediction. These are most importantly the top quark mass, the strong coupling constant, and the Z boson mass. And uh, so this is often called a parametric uncertainty. And if you look in the last two columns, you can actually see that the uncertainty purely from that is also comparable in many cases to the uncertainty of the direct measurement of these quantities. And in particular, in case of the effective weak uh, mixing angle, the leptonic effective weak mixing angle, which can be measured very precisely if you have polarized beam, uh, we will run into potentially a wall coming from the fact that we need the shift of the fine structure constant, delta alpha, from data. That's basically why you see the parametric uncertainty at ILC and TLAB really does change because um, these machines do not necessarily give us information about that. But they have to come from other experiments. Now, moving on to the next slide, I should also mention that besides electroweak uncertainties, there are QED uncertainties, which are important, for instance, from initial state and final state radiation. There has been a lot of effort to compute them for lab, and the current uncertainty on the relevant uh, observables is about 0.1%, which is uh, very good for the current uh, situation, but again, will not be adequate for ILC or TLAB, so more work will be needed on that part too. In addition, because we are mostly interested in Z-physics, we want to subtract the contributions that come from S-channel exchange of photons or the interference or box contributions, anything that's not, that doesn't have a Z-pole. Um, these also have been computed uh, to one loop level currently. Um, the uncertainty from, that, uh, from them is estimated to be rather small, about 0.01%. So that may be actually still good for some time into the future, but uh, it's always important to revisit them, in particular because certain new physics models might affect these parts that we are subtracting as well. So it might not be always um, adequate to just subtract them from the standard model prediction. Now, I mentioned already new physics. So on the next slide, you see that oftentimes uh, what is done in order to estimate the contribution from new physics is to look at the so-called oblique parameters or the ST and U parameters, which are computed from the uh, gauge boson self energies. And this is a good estimate for a few models, but not for most, because this estimate doesn't include any effect of new physics to the fermion flavors which, for instance, could modify uh, the coupling of Z-bos onto leptons or to BB bar or to any kind of other standard model fermions. So instead, if we go to the next slide, 
uh, what one really should do is either directly compute all those pseudo observables. Pseudo here stands for the fact that the QED contributions are already subtracted, so they're not real observables. Um, together with the W mass, the Z width, various branching ratios, and various asymmetry parameters, there are 12 quantities that are relevant. However, if one computes the whole observable, that means one always kind of needs to redo part of the standard model. That is, of course, um, a little bit a waste of effort. What one can do instead, if we talk about TeV scale physics, one can use an effective field theory where we look at higher dimensional operators. The um, first non-trivial order is at dimension six. And there are a number of different operators, which I've listed here. Some of them are directly related to those S and T parameters or the Fermi constant. And some of them are related to uh, Z to fermion coupling. And there are actually, if you distinguish the different fermion types, there are a whole bunch of them. If one counts them all, it's pretty obvious there are more operators than we actually have electric position observables. So we cannot fully constrain that. We can use some other observables, like for instance, W decays or W production to uh, constrain some of them, but there might still be some gen de degeneracy left at the end of the day. However, on the next slide, you see some example of what we can do with today's data already for these operators if we make some simplifying assumption. For instance, that we assume there's flavor universality. So the Z couples the same way to all leptons and it couples the same way to all quarks. And then we get, uh, get very con strong constraints on these operators. In green, you see what one would get if one only switches on one operator at a time. In red, you see what one would get if uh, one switches all of them on and takes into account correlations. Uh, obviously, the error increases in the second case quite significantly because there are non-trivial correlations. But nevertheless, we are sensitive to uh, TV, TEV scale new physics um, in a model independent way of this uh, procedure. So uh, let me conclude. Um, <clears throat> so the current experimental precision that we have for electric precision observables within the standard model um, already demands two loop and partial three loop corrections. Um, fortunately, these are available due to the effort of many people. The LHC will not really increase the precision of these observables during its lifetime, but it's actually still very uh, interesting because it provides independent and very precise measurements of, say, the effective weak mixing angle or the W mass. But at future E plus E minus machines with high luminosity that run on the Z pole, the experimental error may be reduced by about an order of magnitude, which is a big challenge for theorists because that requires um, three loop and some dominant for loop corrections in order to match that precision. Furthermore, we need to arrive at some consensus between us how we combine all these different uncertainties, experimental theory from uh, radiative corrections and parametric uncertainties, because the higher the precision becomes, the more important uh, it will be to distinguish between, say, Gaussian and flat priors or quadratic and linear addition. And finally, uh, if we talk about comparing to new physics, I think it's important that we move away from using SD and U parameters. Instead, for TV scale physics, we may use this dimension six uh, operator approach. Here, another open question that needs to be discussed is what's the best basis for these operators? Because there are different sets of operators which one can use. Each set can be translated into another set but um, there are advantages and disadvantages for each of them. If, however, the physics is uh, at the weak scale or below, then, of course, the effective field theory approach doesn't make sense anymore. For these kind of models, one really has to do what Sven said earlier, compute observable by observable. Thank you. Thank you, Aris, for this very nice talk. Questions? Sven? Yeah, this is Sven.
first of all, one remark to emphasize what you said in the very end. The uncertainties that you gave are valid in the standard model. If we are in the lucky situation to discover any hints for BSM physics, automatically all these uncertainties will increase substantially because then we have to deal with the BSM model and this is then only the very lower limit that you gave. Yeah? It's still important to improve the standard model contributions but then even much more work would be needed. And I have a question on page 11. Just to be sure, you are mentioning here the uh, delta, delta, alpha, and I think this 5 times 10 to the minus 5 is already some optimistic future estimate. And do I see it right that you included this in the parametric uncertainties in the numbers that you gave there? Yes, this is included. Okay. So, um, do you really see this as the best number that has been discussed so far, or are you aware of any further improvements beyond this? Because this could really be the limiting factor from the parametric uncertainties. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not the, the top expert on that, I have to say. <coughs> but I think um, there was some discussion, if we have something like T-Lab or uh, FCEE, I, I don't know how, how I'm supposed to call it, but uh, because it has such an enormous uh, high luminosity, there may be some potential to actually obtain some information about this quantity from this collider itself through a radiative return. Right? So you have a, a photon radiation in the initial state which reduces your effective center of mass energy and you can basically could scan the whole uh, energy range from the rho resonance up to you know, the epsilon resonance. Uh, how precise that really would be possible to do, I, I'm not sure anybody has concretely looked at that, but um, it might be worth looking at that. I mean, what you propose is nice, but I don't think it works at the Z because of the pole. But, uh, um, I mean, one could think to go to lower energies now, I don't know, I have no idea how low can run a machine like this, but uh, maybe we get new information from Bell and uh, from other experiments, and clearly the situation is improved. What, what Babara has done, uh, uh, Michel Davier et al., in, in this is, has been remarkable. And, uh, but, I mean, it would, would be good to, to, to have an understanding of... Uh, when this becomes a limiting factor, which kind of precision is uh, needed and how this can be achieved. Because the idea to use the same machine would not, is not bad at all. Huh? Yeah, but my point was that you could even get information even if you set it a z-pole. Like if you look at the example of Baba, uh, the, the delta alpha information that was obtained from Baba was also Baba was just sitting on the... Uh, uh, on the psi 4 s resonance. But, but, but the, Sorry, the, the, the Y4S is only a factor three larger than the continuum. At the Z, we are, I don't know how much, but a factor a few hundred above the continuum. So. Right, you pay, you pay a bigger price. On the other hand, um, it's anticipated that the machine has an even higher luminosity. So I don't know how that will balance out. Right. Just a second. Super, yeah. Hopefully, so I, I hopefully, think, I mean, super cake B will will do. The alpha that I've written down here includes what some people estimated what you can achieve at L two. Yeah, I was saying that hopefully, super uh, uh, super cake B will do that because they will have a luminosity supposed to have a luminosity close to ten to thirty six. So they will be uh, in, 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 a, in a situation a hundred times better than what Babar had. So right. Uh, since you have a question mark on Delta Alpha S from TLAP, um, we looked at this uh, and it seems like from the WD case, the hadronic width of the W, uh, we could go down to point zero 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 two. I see. Very good. Yeah, I, I just didn't see any number for that in, in any documents that I've seen it's, so far. That's why I left the question mark. It's on the 
It's on the TLAP paper. They uh, first look at the uh, physics case of TLAP. Okay, very good. Yeah, this will be important for the for the ZDK with because their alpha S is, is yeah. fairly important because of QCD corrections in the final state. Right. Although in principle we can extract the hadronic waste from the measurement, and um, we have to be sure we're not. We can't use it twice. We can use it to determine alpha S, or you can use it if you have the alpha S from the Ws. You can use the hadronic width of the Z to look at the uh, uh, what it contains in terms of uh, radiative corrections. Right, right, and this is exactly what was uh, done at lab, and this is, you know goes into this ILC estimate. <laughs> Just one more comment or question on this. Of course, one can do this, but again, one needs the theory calculation of those decays at the same level of accuracy. And I'm not sure that, for example, we have even an estimate where we are there and uh, how this can be improved to this very high accuracy. Yeah, it's, it's always the case that from the experimental side, we get these very accurate numbers, but they have to be matched with the corresponding theory calculations. This is just another example where this uh, comes in. Well, the, the final state QCD correction, this is the part that's important for getting alpha S, uh, those are actually, they are right now already known at the for loop level, and the uncertainty from that is really very small. So that's actually not a limiting factor. There may be potentially some issue with them because they are, of course, included, uh, computed for the inclusive width, whereas what is actually measured includes some cuts on, you know, which jets do you actually see and which you don't see and stuff like that. Um, so that, that is potentially a tricky part which uh, may include, uh, may, may require, you know, much more sophisticated Monte Carlos to evaluate the acceptance that you have in an experiment. Uh, that, that would be yet, an, yet another interesting topic actually which would need to be explored. Okay, I think we need to move on to the next talk. Let's thank Iris again.